if we talk about extreme weather events, it's actually uh, not too difficult to find recent examples uh, of such events. We saw just in the last few months, we saw droughts and heat waves in California. We saw Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Harvey. We had a very serious drought in Europe, which was called Lucifer. Uh, we saw severe wildfires in, in multiple countries, mudslides in Sierra Leone and, uh, and extreme rainfall in multiple places. So we see extreme weather events everywhere. And um, in contrast to, to natural hazards, they are seem to be more higher frequency um, than, than the natural hazards. Um, and unfortunately, what we see also due to climate change, where we expect an increase in temperature, uh, that these extreme weather events most likely will become not only more severe, but also will become and will happen more frequently. And the interesting thing is with extreme weather events that they do not happen only locally, uh, such as a hailstorm or, or extreme thunderstorms, but they can happen also across multiple regions, multiple countries, uh, such as hurricanes uh, in, in, in the Caribbean or extra tropical storms in, in Europe. And these impacts may not only be economically, but they will have socially and environmentally environmental impacts as well. So if we look at the definition of risk, which consists of the of hazard exposure and vulnerability, the main possibility for disaster risk reduction measures for extreme weather events do lie uh, mainly in reducing the vulnerability or the susceptibility of people and assets and crops within a specific area. Um, it is difficult, for instance, to reduce the exposure in an area um, because this would imply, for instance, that we would have to move people and assets out of an exposed area, because at the same time, we cannot simply prevent the specific extreme weather event from coming in. We cannot stop the hurricane, we cannot change the pot. It is something we cannot control. On the other hand, for droughts, it is the same issue. We cannot stop the heat wave from coming in. The only way we can reduce the final impacts of these extreme weather events is to look at the, at the final consequences, the impacts. So that is where we need to put our focus on, try to reduce the impacts when it actually happens. We have to make sure people are more resilient, the assets and, and, and the society are more resilient for these specific events. So if we want to reduce this vulnerability or susceptibility of humans, assets, crops, um, we need to look actually at multiple aspects. We should look at social, environmental and economic impacts uh, of these, all these extreme weather events. But in the end, uh, what most of the time matters most, especially if we want to look at the feasibility of disaster risk reduction measures, but also climate adaptation measures, is about how much it costs and in the end, how much it benefits. And the benefit of all these measures in the end always depends on the avoided losses or almost always depends on avoided losses. And to estimate these avoided losses, we often look at direct and indirect uh, economic impacts of disasters, or in this case, extreme weather events in particular. So on the one hand, we have direct impacts. These are the direct damages that occur to humans, to assets, to crops within the affected area. On the other hand, we have the indirect impacts, and the indirect losses are the induced losses, mainly due to these direct damages. So what we see, there is a business being affected due to a hurricane and this may result in impacts throughout the whole supply chain. Um, this business within a specific area that is affected will most likely not be able to send its goods to another region or is most likely not able to get its inputs from somewhere else or cannot use its inputs from somewhere else, which has impacts throughout the whole supply chain. To estimate these direct damages or these direct impacts, uh, what is most often being used, and that is both in academia and in the insurance industry, is the use of vulnerability or fragility curves, uh, or in the case of, for instance, floods, they call them depth damage curves. Um, what these curves do is they relate, on the one hand, the intensity of the natural hazard or the extreme weather event, so in the case, for instance, for windstorms, this can be the, the gust speed, the maximum gust speed in a specific area. And on the other hand, uh, so that's on the, always on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, we put the potential losses that may occur due to this given intensity. So it is a, a linear relation. 
Um, so in our optimal case, we have perfectly empirically calibrated uh, fragility curves for each specific asset or crop for each given region. Unfortunately, this is not the case and, and this makes it difficult. So we need to make assumptions um, to try to, to get the best estimates. Um, but even given that we have to take assumptions, still this is the best what we can do. And luckily there are many way, methods to go around it and we can compare in relative terms, for instance, the impact of a risk reduction measure given a set of specific vulnerability curves. On the other hand, we have the indirect impacts and how we normally assess those is by using the more macroeconomic modeling frameworks. So the most common ones that are being used are on the one hand, the input-output modeling frameworks, and on the, on the other hand, we have computable general equilibrium models, also in short called CGE models, that can be used to, to estimate these wider economic impacts to see if this business, for instance, is disrupted in this, in this affected area, what are these consequences, further down the supply chain. So when combining both these direct and indirect impacts, putting them next to each other, they allow us to, to picture these potential losses. They allow us to, to create a risk, a picture of the potential risk. The final question then, of course, become how can we use that to reduce the losses and the cost of these extreme weather events? Unfortunately, in, in comparison to, to other natural hazards, extreme weather events are a bit more, more difficult. Each of them requires a different approach and a different method. Uh, and in the case, for instance, with floods, um, we can just build dikes and we prevent the flood from happening. But as already previously said, we cannot simply stop the heat wave or, or, or stop the hurricane. So we mainly need to work on, on adaptation and potentially reducing these consequences. So extreme rainfall, for example, there we really need to require that all the infrastructure and the, and the specific land uses, the agricultural land, can nicely make sure that runoff of water goes smoothly and efficiently to make sure um, that flooding is not occurring. But we also don't want it to happen too quickly, which may result in landslides, which is, of course, also a very big issue. So in the end, what we want, we actually want to make sure that society uh, and the economy is, is in the end more resilient and more flexible, more adaptive uh, to such events, to such extreme weather events. And we just have to make sure that when such an event has happened, we can recover quickly again. Um, we can make sure that where possible, uh, business can continue, households can still buy their goods from the supermarket, water is still supplied, electricity is still supplied. And if there are some disruption in that system, we really want to make sure that can be recovered and repaired quickly and swiftly. Um, so in the end, where we really need to go now in the future is really start to identify what are the potential bottlenecks in these wider systems, where do they interconnect with each other, where do they find each other, and if we have identified these bottlenecks, what can we do to make sure these bottlenecks, these specific bottlenecks, are more resilient, more robust um, towards a changing climate, because we cannot really stop the extreme weather event from happening, but at least we can make sure that we, if it happens, we can handle it.